Good morning, my name is Kevin Elker and I'm a U.S. Public Health Service officer. I have the pleasure of speaking this morning with Miss Brianna Screw Crude. So with that, let's talk about debridement. So I don't have anything to disclose. No off-label treatment will be discussed. We've gotten consent for what we're doing from our patients. And the views here are really solely our own. They don't reflect the institutions for which we work for. So the objectives this morning, uh, we're gonna talk about when to consider sharp debridement as a treatment option. We're gonna verbalize two indications for debridement and two contraindications for debridement. And then list some key elements for documentation. Really the goal is to start to help you develop a conceptual framework for how to answer the question, are you the right provider and is today the right time to debride the wound? So here are the debridement categories. You're probably familiar with these. I'm gonna focus on the last three that are highlighted there. And largely we're gonna talk about sharp debridement. But before we do that, I wanna point out what I mean by low frequency ultrasonic mist therapy because I use it with full contact to the wound bed. So. Lots of times people will use mist therapy. What they mean is holding that uh, ultrasonic tool about a centimeter from the wound bed. When I use mist therapy, I actually fully contact the curette or the device to the wound bed to promote debridement. And I primarily use it for debridement. This is a video that demonstrates that really well. As you can see, the curette is fully in contact with the wound bed. And there is a sharp component almost to it. The company that produced this video uh, happens to be Arabella. However, uh, you know, I don't believe they're actually still in business. There are many types of ultrasonic mist therapy that you can purchase and use in this manner. So when do we consider sharp debridement? Primarily when our goal is closure of the wound, complete closure. However, we can occasionally use it for stabilization. And I'll give you some examples of that. The other reason that we consider sharp debridement is that you're not meeting your healing goals. So what does that mean to me? I'm always looking for a 25% slough for size reduction uh, in two to four weeks. And that is based on an amalgamation of the studies listed here. These are studies of different types of wounds. I don't, I don't differentiate and say this is a venous wound versus a pressure injury versus a diabetic foot wound. I just put them all together. And this has really marched out well for me over the last 10 to 15 years to say, if I'm getting this result, then I know that I have good healing trajectory. So if I'm not getting that and I've gone back and re reviewed mechanism of injury, I've gone and really tried some strategies to uh, try to limit that injury. I've considered other cofactors like, do I have enough arterial blood flow? How is my nutritional status? And gotten the consultations I might need. Then I'm going to consider debridement. So a little bit about techniques. Uh, it's really a matter of risk benefit. There are some patient specific factors that you have to consider. Some patients are like, go ahead, cut away. I can't feel anything. And some have a lot of fear and anxiety. And so you have to negotiate that for each patient. There are clinician specific factors. I've done a lot of debridement over the last 10 years, so is, so is Brie. And so our practice might look different than yours. And then there are facility specific factors that you have to take into account and you have to know about before you start debriding. Usually I use a synergistic approach. I'll do some sharp debridement, some autolytic debridement, sharp debridement, then I'm gonna do some, maybe some enzymatic debridement. So let's talk about sharp debridement, the indications for all types. One is to decrease the risk for infection. And I like to say I'm trying to get the food for microorganisms out of the wound because we don't want to leave that there. So we're removing that non-viable tissue or debris. The other one is just to improve healing rates. And we do this for a number of reasons, mostly to prevent or correct a prolonged inflammatory response in the wound. And so we need to get that debris out so we can limit the inflammatory phase because if we don't then we're going to get some histochemical dysregulation and we want to get that cascade re-established we also want to remove physical barriers to healing and so these are obvious th things non-viable tissue callous tissue closed or rolled wound edges and then we also want to consider removal of biofilm 
Uh, the other reason that we do uh, sharp debridement is to prepare a wound bed if you're going to consider using cellular and tissue products, which we're not talking about today. So let's specifically talk about conservative sharp debridement. This is the intentional removal of non-viable tissue with a sharp instrument, also called selective debridement. Do you sometimes accidentally cut into a patient? It could happen. And what do you do? It's not that big of a deal. You control the bleeding. You, you schedule a follow-up for them and you just take care of the situation. Sometimes that happens, but the goal is not to cause bleeding. Who can perform this? A physician, advanced practice provider, qualified PT, OT, and in most states, an RN. Uh, in most states, a qualified RN does have to have a specific provider order, and competencies for all of these providers are recommended. Do you need consent for conservative sharp debridement? Not technically. Uh, and I usually do a documentation of a verbal consent unless it requires infiltration or some type of nerve block. Uh, I also do it sometimes if I feel uneasy with the patient and then I might get a written consent and I just kind of trust my gut on that. I, I work in the Federal Bureau of Prisons and occasionally I run into patients who I just, I feel like I need a written consent. And then local policy will guide you also. Surgical debridement, I'm not going to talk about very much, but that is the intentional removal of viable tissue with a sharp instrument. Who can perform this? A physician or a trained advanced practice provider. Usually done in the OR, requires written consent, and Bree is going to cover this in depth for us today. So there's this other thing which I call a tweener debridement, and that's because when I look at the literature, there's a practice gap that exists between the definitions conservative sharp debridement and surgical debridement because there's a need to intentionally remove some viable tissue but it's a very small amount and I don't usually consider it functional tissue. What presentations will you see? Smooth non-granulating or non-epithelializing wound beds not meeting healing goals and I'll show you some examples that usually indicates there's a biofilm or your healing cascade is off and the debridement process will reset that. A presence of hyperplastic or what we call sometimes pseudoverrucous tissue closed wound edges, and who can do this? An advanced practice provider, a physician, others in my environment with a specific order. There are some of these tweener debridements that my RN who's wound care certified can do, but they're very specific and that would be institution specific. So terminology, this is, this is really gonna be done in the clinic or bedside. Uh, what do I call it? Because I don't code. I call it sharp debridement with the intent to remove viable tissue and then I describe what I'm going to remove. In an institution where you're going to code and you have to consider those things, it's going to be sharp excisional debridement and then you describe what are you removing and what did you use and was this a partial or full thickness wound and it'll include your pre and post debridement assessment and all wound debridement should include those things. Other considerations are what knowledge do you have, what are your competencies, what's your organizational uh, support for this, and the availability of referral or collaborative serv services if you need them, because you are removing some viable tissue. So here's an example that I'm going to show of a tweener debridement. This is a little more of an extensive one. This is a 27-year-old patient uh, who came to me after having a spinal cord injury uh, a number of years beforehand. This wound had been open for three years over the right ischium. This is four and a half centimeters deep, has a lot of undermining, and the drainage coming out of this is foul. I started treating him with a topical antiseptic, limited his wheelchair seating, ta started talking to him about treatment options, did some diagnostics because we got to check those cofactors. So his sed rate was fine. I, did, I had an MRI done and it was not suggestive of osteomyelitis. So I suggested that we do some debridement and bed rest. So this wound is not going to close at this point unless you have a team approach. Unless we get offloading done, we consider those cofactors like ruling on osteomyelitis. And that wound on the left, the photo on the left, that thick ring of tissue, which we call an epiboly or a closed or rolled wound edge, needs to be opened. And then the deeper part of the chronic wound needs to be cleaned out. And so that's what I did. I excised that in my clinic. And then I took my full contact ultrasonic mist and I took that curette and I cleaned that all out. And that allowed this patient who had had an ulcer for three years to go on to this and this and this. And after two and a half months, he closes. 
this is not a rare case. This is a very representative case in my environment. And why don't I just send him for a flap surgery instead of doing all that work? Because every time we move a muscle that a patient sits on who has a spinal cord injury, when we don't need to, it alters their ability to sit into the future. And that really affects their life overall. Aftercare, we do wheelchair seating. We pressure mapped him. We taught him how to shower safely. We taught him you know, how he does his offloading, both in bed and in his wheelchair. And he lived for years in our outpatient area and did great. Most of these patients do in my environment. Let's quick talk about some contraindications. Patient is medically unstable. We, we need to do some collaboration. Really consider, is this the right time? Concern for ischemia, severe anemia, extensive thrombophilia. Are they on anticoagulation therapy? And do we know what their INR is? We need that between 1.6 and 1.8 to make that relatively safe. Do we have uncontrolled procedural pain with the debridement? Do we have an atypical wound presentation? Do they have pyoderma gangrenosum, vasculitis, something else? And so what are you looking for? Like the photos on the screen, you are looking for at the wound and saying, this doesn't look like a normal diabetic foot wound. This doesn't look like a normal venous wound. If it doesn't, then you need a consultation before you do any debridement because you need to know what you're working on. You also need to know what you're debriding. And so when you look at the photo on the left, it's difficult maybe to determine what kind of tissue is that. And so I consulted with my chief physical therapist who therapists have great knowledge of the underlying anatomy and the patient's primary physician. And we determined that this should be relatively safe. So we did some sharp debridement with a little low frequency ultrasonic mist. And this is what his wound needs to look like to heal. He had had this, this wound, uh, this is a lateral malleolus wound. He'd had this wound for half a year and he needed this cleaned up. Another caution, I don't normally debride small crusts that are on non-weight bearing surfaces of the feet because what you need to focus on is why are they happening? Stop that process and as long as they're not fluctuant or they're draining, then I just let them be and let them resolve naturally. It is still the standard of practice not to debreed dry, eschar, or gangrene on heels. Other, a couple of the things that we, uh, that are cautions, uh, if we have an immunocompromised patient, I tend to be much more careful there. We have a questionable ability to treat the underlying mechanism of injury or the etiology of the wound. And we have to negotiate that offloading for the diabetic foot, the offloading for the pressure injury, and at least a therapeutic level of compression before we consider doing their debridement. Unless you have a wound where the opening is so small that you can't actually get in there and address the wound. Is that in your environment maybe a situation where you need to get a consultation with a surgeon? Sure. In my environment, I don't have a surgeon. And so we are, I'm going to work with the primary care physician and we're going to open that wound and make an unsafe wound safe. And I'll show you an example of that. A little bit about osteomyelitis. If you have a suspicion for osteomyelitis, unless you have that small opening where the wound is not safe, then we really need to explore, do they have an underlying osteo? There are some times where you just need to ask the question, does this fit my scope of practice? Am I the right person to be debriding this? And is this the right time? On the left, the photo on the left, this is a patient who has severe arterial disease. I am not the right person to do that. He needs to see a vascular surgeon the photo on the right, that's someone who has Berger's disease. And so in both of these situations, I'm going to keep these stable and I'm going to consult someone. I am not the right person. A little bit about charting. So what have you found that makes you think that you need to do a debridement? I usually am going to do measurements and a photo. The proposed debridement technique. I'm planning on using a, you talk to the patient, planning on using a scalpel and a pickups. And this is what we're going to do. And I show them on the photo where I'm going to cut. And I usually include that the wound will be larger. I always include that the wound will be larger, but it's going to be healthier. We're going to review indications, risks, benefits, alternatives. We plan for pain management. And then we talk about consent. Is this something where verbal consent is fine or written? And if it's verbal, this is my standard statement. Patient verbalized understanding and agreement with the proposed debridement. If it's written, there may be some institution specific requirements. And oftentimes there's a universal timeout that you need to do. Post-procedure, you got to include your pre-debridement assessment. How did they do with the pain? Uh, what were the measurements? I usually do a photograph. And then I describe, what did I do? What did I use? What did I remove? 
the presence or absence of bleeding, what I usually call capillary oozing, because that's usually all I'm promoting. What was their estimated blood loss? How did I achieve hemostasis and that it was achieved? Super important to list that hemostasis was achieved. And then your post debridement assessment and how did they tolerate it? A little bit about pain management. One is, does the technique require it? I rarely have a callus debridement that requires any pain management. And if the patient had pain, we're going to stop and assess what do we need to do and come up with a plan. But rarely do I need it for that. If they do need pain management, um, I'll start, or if you're uncertain, I'll start with a small area and then work outwards. And if they tolerate it, great. And if they don't, then we have to come up with a plan for that. Usually that's something topical in my environment. And so I normally use 2% lidocaine, occasionally some amyla cream. I put it on for 15, 20 minutes, occlusive dressing over the top if possible. If I need to, I'll do some infiltration with lidocaine, one to 2% with or without epi. I tend not to use epi in my environment, but my patients stay in the walls. And so I get to follow up with them later, but you can use epi. Five to 10 minutes after I infiltrate them, I tend to do start their debridement. Again, just a caution, no, I would never put epi in fingers, toes, genitals, or face. That is beyond my scope of practice. Sometimes you have to do moderate, moderate sedation at the bedside, and Bree can touch on that. That is not something I do in my environment. I would send them to the local hospital for that. And you, you need to consider post-procedure management of pain. Hemostasis, direct pressure is the best way to do it. You gotta hold pressure for five minutes. Don't peak, you gotta wanna peak, don't peak. Uh, elevate the area if possible, if it's the foot, especially a silver nitrate applicator. I use that all the time. It's very effective. You can do electrocautery. I've never had to do that. Um, hemostatic agents. I've never had to do that, but I don't do as extensive debridements as Bree does. Uh, and only one time have I had to put a little suture in a spurting little arterial leak. And then I monitor them. I'll go back and see them a couple hours later. So debridement preparation, you're going to explain what you're going to do and that the, the wound is gonna be larger and healthier. In the bedside or clinic, this is a clean procedure. I, most of the time, will prep the wound with some povidone iodine, but other than that, it's completely clean. I need to have good lighting and positioning for my patients. My arms need to be comfortable to make it safe for, for me and for them, and the patient needs to be comfortable. Safe handling of tools is huge. You do not wanna be cutting towards yourself, and there'll be some examples uh, in a video that I show you but always be thinking about where your blade or your instruments are and keep your hands away and retract your blade anytime that you're not using it. And then you have to wear your proper protective equipment. So how much do you debreed? It depends on the situation. And so you need to clearly understand what your goal is today and clearly understand what it is not because we don't want to do any more harm. So here are the, the types of debridement that I'm going to talk about today, show you examples of, and then do some demonstration for at the end of the presentation. Reducing callus tissue in the setting of neuropathic foot disease. Removing slough or necrotic tissue from the wound bed. Debriding the wound edge to open the wound and make it safer. And then debride the chronic non-granular wound bed. So let's talk about neuropathic related callus tissue. Your indication is reduce that focal callus to alleviate repetitive pressure and prevent ulceration. We're also looking at things like shoes. You know, why are they getting this callus? But we gotta get rid of that callus because it's like taping a marble to the bottom of these people's feet and they can't feel it. It's considered conservative sharp debridement. Your assessment is you're going to pinch the callus. And if you can pinch it and it's hard, then you can debride it. If you can't pinch it and it's supple, I usually stop because you can't tell by sight how deep the callus is. I'm usually gonna shave it down with little bits of um, pairing until you get level with the surrounding skin margins, but you're doing that assessment. Sometimes you get through the callus and there's some squishy, some central fluctuance or discoloration, and you're probably gonna have to open that up. And you ask the question, am I the right provider? Is today the right time? Today is probably the right time, but am I the right provider? Do you need to get some help? Tools. Number 15, scalpel, curette if it's more rubbery, a rotary tool. I use a Dremel with a sanding drum or a pumice stone. So here is, is an example of a very significant callus, and this needs to be removed because this patient's feet are insensate. So the picture on the left is before, and the picture on the right is after. 
This is not normally an area that has enough callus ride to breed. Usually this callus will alleviate itself, but when it gets significant like this, I thin it down. This is a more classic presentation. So both of these photos demonstrate a different angle of a patient who has a right foot fifth metatarsal head significantly thick callus. I use a number 15 scalpel and I'm just gonna thin that down. So what does that look like? Oh, and this is what he should look like after the callus is debrided. You can't see the callus. I've been pinching that to make sure I'm not going too deep and he looks good. Now we need to look at his shoes. So this is what this technique often looks like and I'm very thankful to the National Hansen's Disease Center and their permission to use this video. And what we're doing, what she's doing, look first notice her hand placement, how that's above the scalpel and she's debriding away. She's just doing a little pairing of that callus. She's taking and thinning that down in little sections. She's not digging, she's not stabbing. It's just that nice paring down motion. The only thing I would add is I, I'll stop, pinch. Oh, we need more and keep going. So the next type of debridement I want to talk about is removing slough or dead tissue from the wound bed. Why do we do this? Because we need to get the food out and we need to get them through the inflammatory stage of healing so they don't get stuck there and get a clean wound bed for proliferation. Usually considered conservative sharp debridement. The assessment, we're going to ensure, try to ensure that the tissue is non-viable and I'll show you examples of that. Technique is to remove thin layers at a time as not to cut into the underlying tissue and establish a cleaner wound bed, but it may not be 100% clean, but it's going to be better. And then because we're trying to get them through that inflammation stage and we want to limit how much the body has to do there, we're going to consider maybe some serial debridement and some synergistic methods. I'll often use autolytic debridement in between my debridements or moist wound therapy with autolytic debridement, enzymatic agents, or some low frequency ultrasonic mist. So here's an example of a pressure injury in the back of someone's head. And it, when the slough finally moistened to the point on the top left photo where I could take a pickup and start to peel that back, then I can peel that and start to see a clear demarcation where I can use a scalpel to peel that away. Is all the slough gone? No, but is it better? Yes, and I could put on a hydrocolloid and do some autolytic debridement and he healed up nicely. Here's another example of a failed fifth ray amputation on a right foot. And the wound comes in, lots of slough. This has been here for five, six months, open like this. And I worked with him a little while and then we just debrided it with a curette one day once he was open to that. Took a curette, just lightly dragged that wound bed, get some of that slough out. It's not 100% gone, but it's definitely healthier. So this is an example of using low frequency ultrasonic mist with full contact of the curette to the wound bed. And here's what he looks post debridement so that eventually he can go on to closure without more surgery. Have we removed a lot of viable tissue? No. Have we vastly cleaned up this wound bed and given him a chance to heal? Yes. Uh, could he need more ortho intervention? Sure, but he didn't need to. Low frequency ultrasonic mist with contact and an enzymatic in a patient who has severe venous insufficiency, some arterial disease, and some lymphedema. This wound needs to be cleaned up. He's had these for years. And so we clean this up with low frequency ultrasonic mist. This is what it should look like. The middle photo, that's what that should look like once you get the debridement done so that he can go on to closure. This is a couple of weeks later. Here's a serial conservative sharp debridement with a pickups and a number 15 scalpel and intermittent, uh, also with the autolytic debridement used in between the debridements. This is a patient who came to my environment who had spina bifida and had massive pressure ulcers. These are the size of my hands. And so we started just thinning that away, kind of like in the debridement of the callus uh, video, just taking little snips. This took me hours. And here he is at three days. We got a lot of that out. We do some moist wound therapy that helps with autolytic debridement. Here he is at three weeks, much, much cleaner. And here we are at six weeks and he's doing really well. I don't have to do a lot of sharp debridement, but this is a case where he got some soft kind of floppy hyperplastic tissue in the wound bed in the top left hand photo. And I just silver nitrated that down. Removing slough and necrotic tissue from the wound bed. We're also gonna use an orange model at the end and go through kind of some simulation exercises so you can work on this. 
So let's talk about debriding the wound edge to open the wound. There are really two indications, removing physical inhibition of closed wound edges that are rolled. And there's also the removal of non-viable tissue over a larger wound. So this is non-viable skin, and I'll show you examples. This is potentially a tweener debridement. It depends on what we're doing. Techniques I'll show you in the case examples, and there are a variety of tools that I'll use. At the same time, most of the time when you have to address the edge of the wound, you're gonna to have to address the, the wound bed because it's gonna be chronic, non-granular, smooth appearing. And so we need to clean that up, and I'll show you examples of that, to remove biofilm and just to get it out of that chronic inflammatory stage. We're in, really, we're gonna remove like a one or two millimeters of tissue from the surface of the wound bed. This is potentially a tweener debridement. Your assessment is either gonna be for a smooth, non-granular wound bed, or they're not getting size reduction. Techniques, you're gonna lightly drag with a curette, or sometimes I use silver nitrate to do this, and I'll show you examples of both. So this is a diabetic foot ulcer. On the edge, you can see that the edge is rolled and the wound bed is shiny. And I used a curved iris scissors and I just snipped around there and then took a curette and, and uh, lightly dragged the wound bed. This is what that, this wound needs to close. This wound had been open for months, very representative wound. He had been on antibiotics. That was his therapy before he got to us. What he needs is debridement and offloading. Similar type of wound, diabetic foot ulcer, number 15 scalpel to shave all that callus down and a three or four millimeter curette to lightly drag. Picture on the left is what it looked like before. Picture on the right is what it should look like so that these patients go out, can go on to full closure. What was my primary intervention? Offloading. Offloading is my primary intervention, but they also needed debridement. A pressure injury, used a curved iris scissors and a th th three or four millimeter curette, addressed the edges, drag down the wound so he can go on to closure. This is a left ischial or right ischial tuberosity ulcer. This is a case where this is gonna be a tweener. So you can see the thick rolled edges. Those need to be excised. Do I need a surgeon to do that? In my environment, that is, it's not feasible to do that. So I do that with a primary care physician. However, in your environment, a surgeon might be the best option. But this is what he looks like on the left beforehand. He had had this ulcer for years, and this is what he looked like on the right. When we prepared the wound bed for healing, he went on bed rest, and we got this closed up for him. This is an example where you have an unsafe wound. So first metatarsal head, super tiny opening, and there's nasty fluid coming out of that. Antibiotics in a culture is not what he needs. Just my opinion, but that's not what he needs. He needs a scalpel to thin out that callus. It literally uncovered the ulcer underneath. I lightly dragged it, put him in an offloading boot, and two weeks later, he closed up. And here he is. This is a little bit different edge debridement. So lots of times you'll have ulcers where you have to, there's unattached skin that's no longer viable. And so you, I'll use a pickups and I'll explore that. And then I'll use either a curved iris scissors or a number 15 scalpel. And I'll find the edge of that and I'll just, start to trim off that non-viable tissue because this is what he really has but we can't address the wound until we get it opened up similar situation that callus on the top needs to be excised and i used a number 15 scalpel a toe that i found at a foot care clinic one day and all of that debris and loose skin needs to come off that's just trapping junk in that wound we need to get that removed and this is what he needs to look like similar his toenail just popped right out of there. I mean, it was just a wreck. And this allowed him to go on to closure. You can actually see epithelial tissue proximal to the nail bed right there, already forming underneath there. A little bit about silver nitrate. So indicated for clean, non-granulating or epithelializing wounds, not meeting healing goals. Also, when you have squishy, raised, soft tissue, also known as pseudoverrucous or hyperplastic, and this is for surface level wounds. This is not for deep wounds. Um, and you do have to consider pain management because it does burn. So I, I use this all the time. I probably have three patients right now I'm doing this serially for because that's what they need. But this was a gentleman who had had long-term hydradenitis superativa. I, he, I had uh, requested a consultation with dermatology. Dermatology saw him, did the excision. He returns here and he's like, I gotta shower every day. I, I gotta. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll set you up with wound care, what they decided. But two weeks later, he looks like this. You don't have to be a wounded care expert to know this is not a healthy looking wound. 
he needs debridement. Topical antibiotics is not going to work, topical antimicrobials. And what's the easiest method for him? Well, I don't want to scrape this. It's all bumpy. That'd be really hard. So I silver nitrated it. And here he is at five weeks. Here he is completely closed at 10 weeks. He was able to shower every day, do his own dressings. He only had to come see me twice a week. So the question here is, this is a patient I had early on. This is a gentleman who has severe neuropathic foot disease. He has a transmetatarsal uh, amputation. And what do we have right there in the center of the picture? A huge callus with a draining slit that it, the stuff coming out of there, I can still smell it after 10 years. That needed to be opened. And at the time, I, I didn't know how to do that. Today, I am the right person to do that just to get it stable. Even if there's a toe bone sticking out of there, we need to open it if possible so that we can address it and get something in there to control the colonization. Am I the right person? And is this the right time to do anything with this? <laughs> Absolutely not. Other than to stabilize it, I need an orthopedic surgeon. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Am I the right person or are you the right person today to start considering managing these calluses and is now the right time? I would say yes. Same here. Considering, and if you can't do it because of your scope of practice, talking to someone that can, collaborating with them so that these patients can get healthy. So I think we went over most of our objectives today. The big thing is I just wanted to give you this conceptual framework to answer those questions and start thinking about doing debridement. And now we'll be transitioning to some simulation videos and that's gonna be fun. So now we're gonna talk about simulation. I'm really excited about that. I love teaching this. First and most important thing is that we need to protect you. So let's get our PPE on. I would get some kind of hair covering, a mask. I'm not gonna wear a mask obviously right now. I tend to use these for eye protection because I need the close-up glasses because I'm over 50. I'm going to wear some gloves and those I will put on and oftentimes a gown depending what it is. Do I need a gown for a callus debridement? No, uh, but I might need it for some other things. And usually when I'm teaching this, I try to simulate as live as possible. What are the things that I want to think about? Positioning is really important. You know, on a table like this in simulation, it's a little harder. I'd really want to be down like this so my arms are well stabilized, get my patient in a comfortable position and lighting. The lighting here is for video recording, but I would have bright lights right here. A couple of tool reviews. This is a number 15 scalpel. It's the only one that I tend to use. I don't need an 11 or a 10. I find those cumbersome to use. So I tend to only use these scalpels. And what did I just do? I told you you always retract the blade when you're not using it. So I just committed a huge debridement faux pas. You always retract the blade when you're not using it. Small curved iris scissors. They come in different sizes. I tend to really like the smaller ones like this and they have that little curve to them so I can follow around the edge without poking into someone. Something to explore a wound. This is a pickup, so otherwise known as a tweezers. Uh, and they come with different sized teeth and you find the one that works for you. I do a lot of exploring with this. Sometimes I'll have a blunt instrument I'll use just to explore a wound. Curette. Uh, almost all curettes are the ones I use are disposable, but they all have a sharp side and a dull side. So you just need to know what you're using. Silver nitrate stick, which I mentioned. This is a what I call a cuticle nipper, and it has a little bit of an undercut here on the blade. And sometimes, like on that toe picture that I showed you where the toe skin was all moving off or hanging off that I found in foot care, I may just use that to trim around because it's so safe. I know I'm not going to cut into them. Rotary tool. Use this for calluses all the time with a sanding blade on it. Uh, it's a different bit usually to debride nails. That's another topic. So let's get into our first simulation. Take a look at the screen real quick. What we're simulating is the, the photo right here where you have that thick pinchable callus. So the simulation actually looks like this. We're gonna use a half a orange, and I like to find one that has a navel that's kind of pinchable. And this is a really decent example right here, not a flat navel. And you're gonna estimate to some degree when you simulate how far are you going down. You can go all the way down to the rind. However, normally I'm gonna do a number 15 scalpel, and then just watch my hand placement and start taking little teeny snips and I'm gonna pinch, 
And then I'm going to come back. And I'm going to pinch until I get down to my goal. For me, that would probably be to the rind. And I think that's a really good simulation point. So what do I mean by the rind? This is not how quick we would normally do this. But I don't want to go into the flesh of the orange. What I want to do is get through the pulp and through the rind. So you can hold your scalpel in a lot of different ways. As you can see, I shifted my, my um, technique to holding it like this, more like a pencil. The actual like thickness or the feel of removing the rind is pretty close to removing a callus. So now I'm getting really close down there. I'm actually through some of the pulp and into some of the flesh. So that'd be a little farther than I maybe would want to go. However, one other thing you could consider doing for calluses, like I said, is using a Dremel tool. And I do this a lot in my foot care clinic. Pinch. Really nice tool to be able to do callus thinning. Pinch. Much messier doing an orange than a real foot. So hopefully that helps you with starting the simulation process and getting used to using some of the tools so that you can get used to debriding or thinning calluses in your environment. So our next simulation is removing um, slough or necrotic tissue from a wound bed. Again, it's usually considered conservative sharp debridement. This is a fairly extensive example, but it's no different than finding a small wound that has a lot of necrotic tissue in it. You're just going to take little teeny sections and get down to where you feel really comfortable that you're not getting too close to viable tissue, but you've gotten a decent amount out. So this is the simulation that we would use. So what I've done is I've prepared this wound in an orange. I've taken flour and pudding and thickened it up. I actually mixed some spices in there. And then I took a little blowtorch and I torched that down to give it that kind of textured area like that. I'll tell you, it's nice if you cut the orange open the night before and let it dry some. It's easier for the pudding to stick in there. But this will give you uh, an example that you can start to use to practice this technique. So the first thing I would do is I would take my pickups and kind of go around and say, okay, what am I dealing with? And what I like to do with this when I'm doing conservative is I'm going to get a hold of some of the slough with my pickups and pull it up. And that helps me to be able to determine that I'm really clearly demarcated from any viable tissue. Then I might grab a number 15 scalpel. And that lets me see clearly that I'm only taking viable tissue. I'll come back, find a nice chunk. And this is not unusual. Like in the picture, like in the, the photo that I showed of the back of the head, that's one where, you know, you might have an edge over here that you can start to peel back and then you can remove like this. But I would just keep going until you feel pretty comfortable. The more you do this and you start transitioning to live cases, the more comfortable you're going to be. The quicker you're going to be, you're just going to establish that clinical acumen. So another thing I could do if there's a lot of slough and a lot of eschar and my hands are getting tired, I might shift to a different instrument. And I'm going to use the blade like this so that it's curved upwards. If I use it this way, I could poke the patient. But this way, when it's upward, it's really easy for me to take a little snip there and know that I'm not cutting into the patient or accidentally poking them. And I'm just going to keep going. That whole concept of tweener debridement is interesting because when I, before I was an advanced practice nurse, even when I was, I was like, I know I can use a scalpel, but can I use a scissor? It was just a really interesting question because again, there's that practice gap. Yes, I can use a scissor, but it just wasn't something that entered my mind to start with. But you're just gonna keep going until you get down to where you're comfortable and you're like, ah, 
am I certain that I'm, I, I, I should do more or am I not? And if you stop and you do some autolytic debridement, you do some moist wound healing, you could use an enzymatic, you've gotten through the dry eschar, great. Come back in a couple of days and do some more. That is completely acceptable, but you've already helped to shift this patient and get them through that inflammatory stage faster. So next, I just want you to direct your attention to the screen where you see the photo on the left. And that is, again, one of those wounds that we know that the edge needs to be debrided. And the wound bed, it's shiny. I, and this, this is probably the first day I saw this patient. In this case, it's fairly obvious. I don't need two to four weeks of no size reduction to know that he needs this debridement. So what am I going to do? I'm going to excise the edge and I'm going to scrape down the wound bed. When we talk about simulation or setting up a simulation that you can do on your own, all I've done is taken an apple. I've scooped some of that apple out. I've taken this tool and I've kind of carved up underneath the edge. I took a Sharpie type marker and I marked the edge and I let the base brown. Because what I want to do is think about that, that marker edge as my thick closed wound edge that needs to be excised and the brown base as that smooth, non-granular wound bed that needs to be debrided. So let me show you how you would do that. First, I'm gonna explore it, I'm gonna feel it. And it's, if it's a closed wound edge, it's gonna feel hard like callus tissue, but it's not completely covering. I'm gonna take and I'm gonna explore that wound. Oh, wow, I got some overhang there. So I know where I'm going. And this wound bed, again, is smooth, red, could be shiny, could not be shiny, but so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my pickups and I could do one of two things. I could use a number 15 scalpel, which sometimes I'll do depending on the shape. And I'm going to go under and I'm going to explore that. Where am I at? And it's nice if you can get an over under grasp on the pickups so that then you can feel where that pickups is because you can't necessarily see under there. Again, this is going to be more of a tweener debridement. I'm going to expect some bleeding here. And I'm just going to start pulling that rolled wound edge. And it's nice on these if you can get a little bevel cut. So what do I mean by bevel? A 45 degree angle or so down. I could do the same thing with the curved iris scissors. And sometimes the shape of the scissors just really fits the shape of the wound. And so it's nice because I can... Again, undercut using this, so I know I'm not going to poke into the patient if I do this, if the blade is poking into them, or the pointies. So I'm going to take the pointies, and they're going to be upwards, and I'm just going to start snipping. And sometimes this is really nice because it goes quick. And that's how you do the edge. So we're gonna simulate that we are done with the edge. Now, oftentimes you got a chronic wound and the wound bed is not prepared. You maybe have optimized the edge, but you haven't completely optimized the wound. That's when I use a curette. You can consider other things. You could consider using low frequency ultrasonic mist with full contact, um, but we need to get a millimeter or two of this off. If the wound's not deep, I could use silver nitrate. So on these curettes, I believe that the flat side is the sharp side, but you got to kind of find. So what do you do first? You can do it here and just by feel. Nope. So I need to have the flat side up on my index finger or upwards and the bottom side then is the flat side. So you got, you want to have the, the sharp side. I'm sorry. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start debriding down, removing the brown tissue or the browned flesh of the apple, simulating that that is what needs to come off the wound bed. It's gonna bleed. I'm gonna do some dabbing, control the bleeding, enough where I can complete it. And it really is just a drag. It's an abrading of the wound bed, and it's gonna bleed. What other things might I consider for assessment? Well, I'm, before we do any debridement, like I said, we're gonna do some assessment. I'm gonna feel how close am I to a bone, some other kind of structure. Uh, most of the time, even on diabetic foot ulcers, there's space for you to prep that wound bed appropriately. If there's not, we really got a problem, Houston. And we're gonna have to get a second opinion, potentially. And you're gonna know that. You're gonna know that based on your practice and how much experience you have. But I'm gonna get all of this out.
And you see how I'm getting down to more of a healthy looking fleshy area. That's really, really similar to what you would do for a, to breeding a clean, non-granular wound bed. This is our last simulation. And so again, the photograph that we already looked at in the presentation, this is where you have a small opening to the wound and there's a bunch of undermining. And unless you explore that, you have no idea that it's there and you're not really treating the wound. And so like in the photo, I took my pickups and I went and I did some exploring and we're gonna do that here. If you direct your attention down here, I find this small wound, maybe it's on the side of the foot or it could be a number of areas and I press on there and it's a little bit fluctuant and some drainage comes out, even if it's foul drainage, this needs to be open. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna close my pickups or close my tweezers so they're not scrapey. And I'm gonna start to explore, what do we got under here? And I'm finding, wow, there's not much tissue on the top. It's not like a normal tunnel or undermined wound. This is very, very different. And I feel pretty comfortable here that that's not viable tissue. So. How am I gonna address that? Again, I'm gonna use my scissors. And what I can do by using the iris scissors, again, by knowing which way my, my curve is and where the points are, now that I've explored it, I can just set it to the edge and snip that. This is gonna be a millimeter or two thick. We're not talking about tunnels where you have a centimeter of tissue above there, where you have all that viable tissue. This is where you just have a little bit of skin over the top. If I'm not certain, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna explore, and I'm like, wow, I still got a fair amount. So I would consider this oftentimes conservative because I don't usually really cut into people doing this. Now, if I can't make the curve there, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take my pickups, I'm gonna pull this up until I can see, and then I'm just gonna do little teeny, cuts to loosen that edge. I know where the edge is because of right where my pickups or my tweezers is, and I can see it now. And I would be levitating the patient higher so I have a better vantage point. And now I have most of this off, and I can really see what I'm doing. If I was trying to optimize this wound for healing, what I do is really get it cleaned out. But if I'm just trying to make a unsafe wound safe, I might just trim that right across there. If I need a consult to really feel comfortable that I know what I'm doing, then I just trim it across so that we can start to dress this and make this safe. If I feel really confident that we know what we're doing, then I might do a little bit more debridement. But that gives you an idea of how to kind of explore that area and then start to excise that non-viable tissue over the top and address the edge of the wound to get it open. Again, my name is Kevin Elker, and I am a U.S. Public Health Service officer detailed to the Federal Medical Center in Rochester, Minnesota, where I've had the pleasure to serve and work in wound management for 15 years, uh, and I have really enjoyed it. And I'm very, very happy that you joined us today, and I hope that you found this helpful. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mayo Symposium 2021. My name is Brianna Screwcrude, one of the co-course directors and the presenter today discussing surgical wound debridement. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background. I am a nurse practitioner. I've worked with trauma critical care general surgery for nine years. About the last eight years, I have been working primarily on the non-vascular wound service, which is an inpatient wound service with the general surgery team. I have worked with general surgeons. We have listing privileges and we go to the operating room and perform our surgical debridements. So today I'm gonna to go over some case studies on some of the wounds that we have taken to the OR and give you indications when to take patients to the OR. I have one disclosure. All of the photos and videos have been obtained after patients have consented for both photography and videos. Some of the learning objectives will give examples of why sharp debridement is performed in the operating room, discuss which patients need surgical debridement in the operating room, and describe sharp surgical debridement techniques that I use in the operating room. So why do we go to the operating room? I call it the surgical ambiance. The lighting is phenomenal. We have at least two or three bright lights that make it very nice to see the wounds. It's in a sterile environment. We have sterile drapes, we use sterile gloves, and sterile sharp instruments. Electrocoagulation, which we call cautery, 
which helps to stop the bleeding and also can cut the wounds with the non-viable tissue. Another reason why we go to the operating room so we can do an excellent wound exploration. If there's a large area of necrosis, we're able to do a complete resection of the necrosis area. We're able to remove devitalized tissue and we can quickly remove all of that and most of the time in one setting. And this is also a great place to look at these wounds that have undermined cavities to see if we need to open them up or interrogate them to see if they have any unhealthy tissue or what we call tunnels. So when do we debride? When do we take the wounds to the operating room? Again, when there's large area necrosis or devitalized tissue, signs of abscess with purulence. And you have to know the classic signs of an abscess. And we're gonna kind of go over these classic signs of abscess and show you what purulence looks like. Traumatic wounds, especially if they're open uh, wounds that have bone exposed, that is an automatic trip to the operating room. Necrotizing soft tissue infection or a severe soft tissue infection. For sure is a stack consult. The necrotizing soft tissue infection is a stack consult. And we try to expedite the patients to the operating room. But before we go to the operating room, I have a long conversation with the patient. If they're able, some of the patients are so sick, they, we have to do an emergent informed consent, like call a relative to go to the operating room for consent. But if I have a patient that is alert and orientated, I sit down with them and I go over the informed consent. And a lot of times I consent for surgical debridement, say it's a right lower extremity, and I let them know that they have a small opening that could be a bigger wound when I take them to the operating room. So I let them know that they may have a small wound now, but by the time we take them to the operating room, this may be a much larger wound. Sometimes we have to discuss going back to the operating room multiple times. When I do my consent, I do the one time to the operating room, what I will be debriding, what the wound's gonna look like, possible multiple trips. Maybe I need to close the wound during one of these OR trips. And then I just go over the informed consent in, in detail. I also look at the anticoagulation status. Usually for me, my threshold is 1.8 for an INR. So I always wanna make sure, are they on anticoagulation? Some of the new novel anticoagulations, you have to hold for five days. Some you only have to hold for two. So you have to know the anticoagulation status so they can safely go to the operating room. If it's an elective surgery, I like to medically optimize them. We do a pre-anesthetic medical exam. And then if I believe that the, when I take a patient to the operating room, if they have a low hemoglobin and we may run into bleeding, I always ask for a type and cross match. All right, so we have this large area of necrosis. This is a coccyx. This is a wound that started off as a deep tissue injury in a super ill patient in the um, progressive care unit. And it has evolved into an unstageable pressure wound. So I consented the patient for the OR. Intraoperatively, we use the, the cautery to cut all of the necrosed area out. So now you can see we have a full thickness wound. This doesn't look the greatest. So with this patient, we actually had to take him back to the operating room multiple times. The next one here is an unstageable pressure injury. You can see on the left, there's some dry eschar. But then when you look kind of distal to the wound, and let's say that's about a six o'clock region, there's some grayish tissue that's kind of soggy and, and, and has a little bit of depth to it. That, when I see a wound that has a little bit of that gray area, I get nervous because a lot of times with these unstageable wounds and the eschar, you just don't know how deep they are until you actually debride it. So the picture to the right, um, is a full thickness wound. It's actually a stage four because the one area that kind of has a little divot in it is down to muscle. So this is a stage four pressure injury. Now this is another wound that started out as a deep tissue injury. We had performed some bedside debridement. We had utilized a scalpel and some scissors. And so the one on the left is some dry eschar necrosed area. And then on the right, Again, when I start seeing this gray texture to the, the tissue, I get really nervous because I, my clinical spidey sense tells me this is a deeper wound, full thickness wound. So we took this patient to the operating room and cleaned up all that devitalized tissue. Now, this photo is of a left hip. 
you can kind of see this little this little fluid draining that is purulence that is a problem so you have a, an area of skin necrosis you can't really tell because of the patient's skin there is some mild erythema so when you have a wound like this you want to palpate around the edges and feel for fluctuance which this patient had fluctuance and you can see the purulence so this is a problem this is badness we need to take the patient to the operating room Intraoperatively, we used our cautery to kind of cut the area into it like an elliptical type of a wound. And now you can see some healthy tissue. The picture on the left, when you look at a wound that's been freshly debrided, you're gonna see these areas of really dark black areas. You can kind of see they're in centrally at the base of the wound. This is from cautery. So if you know a patient has been to the operating room in like one or two days, you're doing the dressing changes, and you see this dark area, this is normal, this is cautery over time, this will slough off. But intraoperatively, we were able to remove, explore the wound. There was a couple areas that had some tunnels that we were able to interrogate and open up nicely, so now it's a safe wound, easy to pack. Signs of an abscess with devitalized tissue. You have to know the, the classic signs of an abscess. So on this photo, so you can see the rectum, there's some dead necrotic tissue. And even before I went in the room to see the patient, I could smell the wound. So usually if you can smell the wound before you go into the patient's room, you usually know you're taking them to the operating room. So dead necrotic malodorous tissue along the coccyx. And the reddened area, which you can kind of see between the devitalized tissue and to the right buttock, this is what's called fluctuant. So when you go to palpate, it's kind of boggy so we have redness, which is a classic sign of an abscess. You have uh, warmth, swelling. A lot of times patients will have pain and then loss of function are your kind of five classic signs of an abscess. Again, you know, it's all about the photos. You gotta get the up close. This is dead necrotic tissue. So we took the patient to the operating room. We sharply excised all of the, the skin, subcutaneous tissue down to devitalized uh, tissue. Where the yonker is, is the area that undermined, and a couple areas where we marked off is all of that area underneath there is undermined. So intraoperatively, we were able to explore the wound thoroughly. We identified all the tunneled areas, washed the wound out very good, and then this patient had to go back to the operating room multiple times. And then over a couple weeks, two or three weeks, this wound had granulated in significantly with negative wound vac therapy. But the importance of taking the patients to the operating room in this case is when we were in the operating room, we were able to identify all the devitalized tissue, all the tunnels, thoroughly wash it out, and this gave us the best chance to get this wound to heal. Again, signs of an abscess with purulence. This is a left lower extremity wound. You can see the cellulitis. Now what I try to do is when I, when I do my exam, if there's small openings, especially if you can see a little bit of purulence, you wanna explore that wound. So you, a lot of times I take like a Q-tip and explore the wound. With this patient, you looked at him kind of sideways, it hurt. So I knew the patient had all the signs of an abscess, that I knew this patient needed to go to the OR. The next photo that I wanna show you is intraoperative video of expressing purulence out of the wound. I was not able to do this at the bedside, but this is in the OR with general anesthesia that I am squeezing out the purulence. And you can see this small opening, and there is some blood in there, but usually purulence is, is either milky white or kind of this light tan. In the OR, what we do is, besides looking at the CT scan, we will explore the, the tunneled areas. So sometimes that's how we know to open it up. So in this photo, um, the areas that are open, especially by the, the ankle and the shin, those were the areas that had the openings with most of the purulence. The third photo that you can see here is on the lateral aspect of the lower extremity that we had to excise it open because that's where the tunneled area was. So now we have some open, safe wounds, easy to do dressing changes. Traumatic wounds. So the photo on the left is something called a morale lavalier lesion. And this is like an internal degloving. And over time, this had, had the dry black eschar, and then it became fluctuant in signs of infection. So we took the patient to the operating room. The picture on the right 
is post debridement. The wound has healed up flush with the skin and then we had to clean it up a little bit and then we put a skin graft on there. But again, traumatic wounds um, that require operative debridement. When you're looking at necrotizing soft tissue infection, or especially when I'm trying to rule out necrotizing soft tissue infection, there are multiple diagnostic tests I can utilize. One is called a Lorenic score, which is a laboratory risk indicator for necrotizing soft tissue infection. And what that does is it looks at a CRP, so lab values, CRP, we look at the sodium, if they're hyponatremic, they'll get like a certain score for that. Hemoglobin, glucose, and creatinine. And you kind of calculate the score, and usually if it's above six, then that would warrant at least an a intra-op biopsy, deep tissue biopsy or wound exploration. This patient scored a 10. But not only do I look at the Lorenic score, I also look at my clinical evaluation. So this patient, I was super concerned because she had all the signs of the abscess. She was sick in the ICU. And then we looked at the CT scan. And so on the CT scan, you can kind of see the reddened area that I measured out. And there's little black circles kind of close to where that line is. And that those black areas is air and it should not be there. And it tunneled eight centimeters. And it's right along the fascia, you see these gas bubbles, which is indicative of necrotizing soft tissue infection. So this is a, an, an emerge, like patient needs to go to the operating room as soon as possible. Intraoperatively, this patient was in a prone position. The photo to the left um, shows, you can't really tell, but we were down to the coccyx, so bone was exposed. And the area that we saw on the CT scan that was about eight centimeters tunnel is along the left buttock. So we had to sharply excise all of this area out so we had a nice open wound that is easy to pack. And then the photo on the right, there's an instrument where we have kind of put into the wound and that just shows the depth of the wound. So this wound is very large with a, with a tunnel or a depth along that left buttock. And so for this patient, um, the post-op diagnosis is necrotizing soft tissue infection. And we also say debridement and irrigation of sacral wound with excision of full thickness skin, subcutaneous fat. And a lot of times how we calculate that 440 square centimeters of total body surface area is the length and the width of the wound. That's how we calculate um, that number. And then whatever we have excised of the muscle, we take a, a measurement of that. So in this case, the patient that we just reviewed, we sharply excise the muscle and the fascia, approximately nine centimeters, nine square centimeters total body surface area. And we did an ostectomy with excision of bone. And so you kind of measure out what portion of the bone that you excised. And then also in our operative note, we have to clarify and state what sharp instruments did we use. So in this case, we used the, the cautery to cut. We also used the scalpel, scissors to cut the tissue, and then rangers for the bone. So the rangers are like these little graspers that you could just kind of grasp onto the bone. And so that's considered a sharp instrument. What I would challenge you to is become an expert at identifying the abscess. You know, if your patient has the classic signs of an abscess, there's purulence, there's large area necrosis, these are the times that the patient should be expedited to the operating room. Thank you so kindly for your attention. And if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer them. <music>